thanks everybody. And for anyone who's watching, uh, if you'd like to send a question in to questions at uh, ndn.org, uh, you can do so. Uh, and we, last time we did this, we actually got a lot of questions from our audience outside the room. And but let's uh, let's start. So we'll just open it up to folks in the room who would like to begin it. Of questions, and if we have, uh, when we get questions from the internet, let us know. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Steve Brandt. I'm from New York City. And um, Rob, I wanted to key on a comment you said, which is that we have no model for this. Mm. And I come from a design background. And what I see is that this is not just a, a bigger version of some past cycle. This is the end of a historic cycle. If you look at economics being a product of culture, see, I'm not an economist, but I study cultural evolution, and we've got a global situation that is no longer a world of Darwinian competition because we have this sense that we are all one interdependent human family. And we have, through the sustainability movement, the recognition that growth at all costs is actually not good, but the sustainable use of resources and development, development not being the same as growth, is what we need. So in economics, based on the end of Darwinian competition and, glo and global cooperation, and the end of growth being the uh, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and development, replacing that is this new model that some people are starting to talk about, but they're not traditional economists. The traditional economists don't, I think, come from this cultural change perspective. You're all sort of stuck in thinking that the world hasn't had a fundamental cultural change. So I'd like to ask you to talk about the notion of this mess being solved when we think in terms of an economics of collaboration and sustainability rather than competition and growth. Thanks. Well, I, um, you know, I, I, uh, I don't. I, my own view is that kind of competition and the desire for growth is kind of not a cultural phenomenon, but a more of a human phenomenon. But um, we don't have to argue that. W what's important here is that any, any large upheaval in an economy or a political system um, reveals new preferences and needs. And you can identify them and use them to try to uh, motor your way out of where you are. Um, you know, I spoke to a group of private equity managers a little while ago, and um, I said, God, you know, this should be the best of all times for you guys. If it, you know, they were all moaning about how they couldn't get financing for their big deals. I said, there are thousands and thousands of companies that need your financing now, small companies um, that have, you know, that are – Whose, whose competitors are falling by the wayside, so there are new market opportunities. You know, this should be a great time for you guys if you begin to think of it in those terms. Well, the, the same thing is true, you know, if, if in fact our certain uh, traditional industries in the United States, that the weaknesses of those industries has now been starkly revealed by the economic downturn. You know, I think of auto is kind of the obvious case, but it's – it may be true in a lot of other areas, too. I'm pretty shocked that GE is in trouble, for example. Um, well, there are, you know, there are new industries that, can, that, that we need to refocus investment in human capital on, for which we know there will be a significant demand. Um, uh, one of them is obviously uh, less carbon-intensive energy um, uh, sources and less energy-intensive technology. Uh, to deal with climate change. Um, and, you know, I think that, and indeed, as kind of old industries fail, that releases a lot of capital, and human and physical, that can shift into, into new areas that can try to drive you out of, this kind of, out of this kind of problem. I hope, for example, you know, one thing which is, look, in a, one of the things we're going to face, we're, we're going to face a whole series of problems really hard problems that arise out of our responses to this crisis. Not to the crisis, but to the responses to the crisis. 
One is the prospect of inflation three to five years down the road, which, will, which arises out of what we're doing to the monetary base. We're going to try to pull some of that back. We can't pull it all back without driving the economy down again. Um, another is going to be an enormous financing crisis, global. I do not, I, I am not convinced there will be enough global savings to meet all the global financing demand um, a year from now. And that means the normal result of that is higher interest rates, which is, that is the price of the capital goes up, not exactly what you want in the midst of a glo deep global recession. Um, a, um, uh, well, the, in the face of that financing problem, the largest issue for the United States is health care, um, is the cost of health care, and which is already, you know, it rises two or three times the rate of inflation and has for 35 years, and now it's about to collide with, with the retirement of the boomers, which matters because cancers and heart disease is highly concentrated in people 60 and over. Um, uh, well, this can be the kind of impetus for um, deep reform that we've never considered in healthcare in order to contain the rate of, rate of, rate of increase in cost. Because, you know, as Ben, the late economist Ben Stein said, kind of very memorably, um, unsustainable trends end. <laughs> They're unsustainable. Um, and so we're going to have to say, you know, this is, this is about the, the, the economic stability of the United States, which has been revealed by this crisis. We cannot sustain this kind of health care, rise in health care costs any longer. And now we're going to consider whole different ways of approaching this because we have no choice. May I take, intrude in your answer? Um, um, I don't know if the assertion that uh, Darwin, you called it economic Darwinism and uh, the hope for growth or the go having growth as a goal. I don't know if that's your prescription, that's your diagnosis of what's going on, or that's your hope. Uh, but one needs to be very careful not to extrapolate to the rest of the world what you may feel in New York. Go and tell uh, millions of Chinese that are more than competing more than ever that instead of growing at 12 percent, they're going to grow at zero because that's better for them. Or go tell that to the Indians that have become a very powerful force in the world for commerce and trade and growth. Uh, disdaining growth is a luxury that only uh, some Americans and some Europeans can indulge us, and not all of them. Go tell to the people that are going to be laid off in Detroit that growth is not really cool. That it's better, and that it's better not to be that competitive. That it's the ruinian thing is really not that great. That we better, you know, stop competing and stop being Darwinian, and hold hands with Saab. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, but but uh, all I'm, no. But there is. Uh, I am actually using that that, that point to, to be to, to essentially. It's very easy in Washington and New York to get carried away uh, by perspectives that are dominant here but have absolutely no bearing in the experiences, hopes, and votes, and political behaviors of uh, peoples around the world. And in fact, just one final comment on that is that <coughs> it's been in the end's analysis that global competition is going to radically increase uh, in future years because of the coming online, the rise of the rest, as believe Zakaria has called it, and that in fact, the strongest argument I think Barack Obama has for his budget is that we, if we want to maintain the standard of living that we have, we have to do more. And if we stay, if we stay the status quo, if we keep the course where we were seeing declining wages and incomes in the United States, if we want to accept that as the inevitable reality of where we're headed, it's fine. But I think that in order for us to imagine again growing standards of living in the United States, we're going to have to do more. We're going to have to compete harder. We're going to have to uh, recognize that this rise of the rest, which was a central goal of American foreign policy for 60 years, and that we are more singularly responsible for it than any country in the world, has happened.